Welcome to another episode of the Canon Studios podcast. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and listening in today. We are super excited to have a friend of mine, uh, somebody that I get to to work with, hang out with, and talk all things uh, Michigan football, go blue, D&D, um, <laughs> technology. Like it's it's awesome. So, Don't forget um, Taylor Swift. Yes. Oh yeah, Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah, I, I hadn't planned to get there, but we'll get there now. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, thank you for being with us. Uh, Michael Caldwell, Mayor of Woodstock, but um, more importantly, why we're here with you today, like um, the one of the founders of Black Airplane, a company that we um, have just we just have a ton of respect for, and like mm-hmm. we look at that as like kind of a, a standard for um, building, you know. I mean, at this point, like, it's, I don't even feel comfortable calling it like small business in our community. Like, I feel like it's, <laughs> it's like, you know, yeah. it's, yeah. So yeah, all that to say. You, you have no idea you. how cool hearing that is because, yeah. uh, when we kicked it off in 2017, it, it, that is not what it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it was a cubby at the circuit. We were the first members over there Yeah, and, uh, it was a, I mean, it bootstrapped, pull it together, make it work. Yeah. Uh, and it has been really awesome just to sort of watch the team that's developed around it yeah. and the community rally around it. And yeah, we're proud of it. Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. Absolutely. As a, you know, as a developer that gets to come in there and just like hang out and experience like what it's like to be on that team and be a part of it. I can tell you it's, it's great. A, so, well, thank you, you know. for that. Thank you. Thank you. If you're, a, if you're a young developer out there, you know, Forget Netflix, Facebook, all the, you don't want to, you don't want to work there. You want to work at Black Airplane. So I'm, uh, I'm in no way biased and I completely agree. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no bias. Yeah. That is, uh, unequivocally, empirically correct. The right answer. Uh, all right. So, um, now that I'm past my, uh, semi awkward introduction. That was good. You're getting you better did a great each job. time. You did yeah. a great job. All right, thank yeah. You. Good job. Well, I'm going to end it right there then. <laughs> um, the easiest podcast I'm going to do all year. Yeah. <laughs> we aim to please. Man. That's all. <laughs> got to talk about Taylor Swift. Got to talk about black airplane. Mayor yeah. got thrown in there. We knocked yeah. it all out. There you go. Check, check, check. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Gianni, you want to kick us off? You're sure. Question answer. A better question ask here. I don't know about that. Um, so let's jump straight into into Michael, the person, right? Um, we know you as kind of the roles that you hold um, as a leader in a company, a leader of a city, um, which is a big deal. But we're going to start with, like, what was your favorite toy growing up? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a good question. Um, I uh, I jumped toy to toy constantly. So I, I learned uh, quickly I'm a... I'm a collector at heart, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I'll illustrate that with the most ridiculous example I can come up with. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Uh, Back when cell phone cameras were brand new, I Mm -hmm. rallied all the kids in the neighborhood uh, over in Town Lake to go walk the entire neighborhood. And we took pictures of everyone's license plates. (laughs) I have no no reason. You want to really creep out your neighbors in the the mid 90s. You have people taking pictures. (laughs) Uh, But I... uh, I don't know. As a kid, I love video games and that's a, that's something that stuck with me too. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I loved growing up. I loved first person shooter games, but I really, it's funny. My eight year old has gotten me so into Minecraft. Yeah. Uh, mm. yeah. When he was like six and seven, got me really into it. Now, unfortunately my kid doesn't like to play it anymore, but I can't stop. <laughs> <You got it. laughs> so it's, like, yeah, Kyle knows we've got a black airplane Minecraft server yep. even. And, uh, oh, wow. and it's hilarious because the team will jump in and every, it feels like every other quarter I can get everybody riled up about it and they'll yeah. all come in and play then they all leave and I'm all alone again and I <laughs> talk them back into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I don't know. I feel like that, that game for me, it, it leans into that urge to create mm-hmm. and build and, uh, and lean forward. And so it's a, it's a great creative outlet for that where the stakes are low, but the outcome can be fun. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Minecraft. Yeah. Minecraft. Yeah. Cannon loves it. He's, he plays on his switch. So yeah. He's, yeah, yeah. He's been into it. I, I have not gotten to play yet. I think Mm-mm. I like try to help him get out of trouble sometimes, but that's like as deep as I've gone. I've got to know what you're doing this weekend, man. I, I don't know. If, I don't know if I've told you about the black airplane server that I just talked about a second ago, but uh, <laughs> you're going to see an invite here very shortly. Yeah. I, yeah, I've heard about it. And then I'll like go and uh, Google like, you know, Minecraft server, like how do you, like how to start? Cause I'm, you know, just super self-conscious. So I'm like, I need to play first and know if I'm, 
good at this, but I don't even know if it's something that you get. There's, there's no way. Yeah. It's there's like, no way to ever feel good at it. That's, yeah. Maybe that's why I like it. It makes me feel inadequate all the time. Yeah. So it's, yeah. <laughs> that's line. Funny. Yeah. Podcast is going to get real serious, real fast. We're going to start getting into my real deep personality flaws. <laughs> Cause I, I started playing Fortnite for a little bit and then like realized that the, the curve for like how yeah. good you can get at it. It gets real. I'm steep, way real too fast. late to get started there. Yeah. yeah. So, I like Fortnite. Yeah. I I, she likes it. I, yeah, we used to play together and eventually when I hit the point of the curve where I was just like looking straight up, I was like, I, I don't want to play this anymore. Yeah. I'm going to play a different game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm taking my ball and going home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so. We also figured out that we were playing during times where it's probably like high school students playing right. mm-hmm. that play all the time. Yeah. And we would play like once every so often. We were getting bullied online. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah it's, it, we're, we're past the point now though where you can like look for the peak times where all the eight year olds are playing and win. Yeah. And even there, they'll kill me now. So yeah. it's not a, yeah. Yeah. there's no, it's they might be worse win. actually. Like, <laughs> you got those like, like fidget reflexes and it's like exactly (laughs) yes can't keep up absolutely cool that's the hard-hitting content you guys were hitting for with yes that was it it's all on camera it's all recorded yes yes sound bites are there yeah absolutely well on that same token if you could be any fictional character for 24 hours who would you be and why man i read that (laughs) question when you sent it to me i it's a really hard question. I, uh, I don't know. I'm, I've never really been a diehard fiction fan. Uh, mm-hmm. I am a big reader. I think I've read 12 books this year so far, Oh wow. but I'm a, I'm a nonfiction reader. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I had to pick though, uh, it'd be Sherlock Holmes. Oh, um, wow. but uh, wait, he's not real. <laughs> that's, that's a thought that's gonna fester. <laughs> like, I just remove someone from history. Oh like, man! <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know that's uh, funny you say that though because it, it, that was immediately where my head started going was just straight to historical figures. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, I, there's no way to sound dumber on a podcast than to come on and answer a fictional character choice with a historical figure. Yeah. So I did the opposite. Instead, I gave you a, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'd be Genghis Khan. It's like, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> that guy seemed like he ruled. <laughs> but, Sherlock Holmes. Why, yeah. why Sherlock Holmes? You know, I think, uh, maybe, Part of it's aspirational in that I am never the guy who actually knows what's going on when no one else does. Mm. Uh, and so I love the idea of uh, how ha- I feel like I am a um, at heart. I like to believe that I'm a uh, visionary leader, that I can try to cast a broad vision and yeah. help execute toward it. But I'm rarely the guy who stands in a room and has the big picture that nobody else has. Mm. Uh, and so I love that about Sherlock is just that ability to walk into a situation, mm. um, adopt the context clues that everyone else mm-hmm. missed and see what happened from start to finish. Yeah. Uh, that takes work for me. Mm-hmm. And so I love the idea of that coming naturally. Yeah. Uh, I do think those are learned and practice traits. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I hope I'm better today than yesterday. Yeah. Uh, but I, I I love that character for that. I love the constant twist. I love the constant, yeah. uh, just contextual awareness. Right. Um, and I'll really nerd out with you here for a second. One of my favorite Star Trek quotes is, um, universal laws for lackeys context is for Kings. Wow. Mm. And it's this concept of, uh, having the broad picture is how mm-hmm. you, how you make adequate long-term decisions that yeah. build broad health for everyone. Nice. Oh, wow. I love Sherlock I like for that. Yeah, <laughs> nice. absolutely. I get the, the title of that book from you. <laughs> I need to get a note of that. Yeah, that's awesome. So I do have one other question. Oh, yeah, to please. follow up on that, is it the you said the book Sherlock, right? Not the RDJ or Benedict Cum- Cumberbatch. Oh man, I love Benedict Cumberbatch as Sherlock, but no, yeah. it'd be the it'd be the the genuine the original. Yes, exactly. Yeah. OG, OG <laughs> Sherlock. <laughs> but man, Benedict did such a good job in that yes. series, and it? it did such a great job with that series of bringing it into modern day and really yeah. making it con- work contextually. And yeah, I uh, I really yeah. enjoyed that. That's yeah. a rewatch for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, RDJ was more like the the Michael Bay Sherlock, right? Was, yeah, very much like explosions, and punching, like hit the girl. It's like I'm glad we have. It, but I, yeah, yeah Benedict we, was where, yeah. w- was what, it was the hero we needed that we didn't know we needed. Right. <laughs> yeah, cool. Go ahead. Me? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So this is a, a, a fun question. I, um, and it's kind of like two parts to it, but um, can you give us one bad habit that you currently have or that you used to have, but broke? 
Who? Uh, <laughs> you want me to call my wife? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, know, I know we can produce yeah. a list here. Yeah, we get, um, we <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, I mean, off the bat, uh, a habit that took real intentionality for me to break uh, was just a complete and total lack of ability to delegate. Mm -hmm. Um, I am a doer at heart. Uh, and so the challenge is that becomes unscalable really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And so it took a lot of work for me to shift mindset from the, Oh, I can do it better and faster than I can teach it to Mm -hmm. the recognition that, uh, the only way you scale and build value and uh, is adding process and adding help. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so that, that was a habit that was re- that, that habit of just sort of grabbing it and going, never yeah. asking what's the best way to do that. What's, what's the most efficient and best way to build a team around this as opposed to just doing it. Yeah. yeah. So that, that took, uh, that took years of work. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. a good nugget for <laughs> that, sure. That absolutely deserves like a, you know, a coffee conversation. <laughs> that, yeah. We're the both of us, you I know, struggle to delegate. Like it's I, hard. And, and, yeah. you know, for me, I think, uh, it gets easier, the bigger, the teams, you're the bigger, your teams get in yeah. part because the work genuinely does become undoable. There's just too much of it. But yeah. number two, because, um, you start to recognize the, uh, where I think my mindset switched was when it stopped being about me and started being about the team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the more that I take and do and don't hand off and, uh, allow team members to do Mm -hmm. the less growth capability and growth opportunity I give the team. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, building out comprehensive roles requires everybody to have identified roles and own them and own the outcomes. Mm -hmm. And you, you're never going to build those for people if you're not Uh, shifting into delegating. So that is, Yeah. yeah, that is so good. Yeah, I feel like, no. I feel like we haven't even gotten good into because like, I can go the bad habit route. All, and we could do a whole podcast around yeah. things I do wrong. So yeah. that's a, that's that's a, a different good podcast. One. That's, that's, that's absolutely true. That um, is true. Yeah. So, um, cool. Um, okay. So then, uh, follow up to that, or I guess the second part of that is what's a good habit that you have, or what's a good habit that you would like to develop? Yeah. Um, so I've got, I'm proud to say I have several of these I think are uh, worth sharing, but I think um, the one that I love for stuff like this is uh, handwriting notes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm a, in high school, I hand copied the new Testament. Like I'm a big oh, believer wow. in handwritten. There's just something valuable and tactile to put yeah. in pen to paper. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the world where uh, we get 300 emails a day, mm-hmm. uh, an email thank you is nice to get, yeah. but it feels routine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But when you get a letter in the mail that, oh, yeah. uh, that stands out. And so for me, I spend, uh, I spend the first 10 minutes of every day and then I have intentional time set aside every Friday yeah. to go back through my week and ask, uh, who needs a note of encouragement or a note of thanks from my week. Wow. And I try to, uh, I, tr- I say, I try to do, I do it at bare minimum weekly. I try to do it daily, but it is a, um, it's a habit that I started that honestly, you can't help, but feel really cheesy while you're doing it yeah. because there is something that feels, um, almost out of place in mm-hmm. writing a note and then mailing it to someone in today's day and age. Yeah. Right. But, uh, I've done that now for goodness going on 10 years and the amount of fee- just positive feedback I get yeah. from that. Yeah. Uh, it's a habit I will never let go, right. yeah. uh, because it, it, I, I think it makes an impact on the people I'm writing for. The real value I found in it, though, is that it makes an impact on me. Every week I have to sit down and think about mm-hmm. the people in my life that I think need encouragement, that yeah. I, I should be intentionally trying to help and bring alongside. Yeah. And then the people that I'm grateful for through the week and what they've done yeah. for me in the week. And that is just a really healthy exercise, I think, yeah. for anybody. Uh, and so that habit in itself allows me to be more reflective and more grateful and more encouraging. And it also allows me to take those feelings and not just leave them in that meditative state, yeah. but mm. turn them into something that I yield for other people. So yeah. it's a, it's a habit I've really enjoyed and has, uh, has yielded a lot of value in my life. Wow. That is- that's an Hand awesome habit, notes. man. I'm not <laughs> yeah. gonna lie. That, that well, I, I will. Me. I will give the credit where it's due. Uh, there's a book called Love Works, mm-hmm. written by a uh, gentleman named Joel Manby. He's the okay. former CEO at uh, Hershen Entertainment and SeaWorld. Um, he's actually the chairman of the board at Orange, who is a oh, okay. big, uh, big partner of black airplanes. Um, and it's funny because I read the book long before we ever started black airplane. Yeah. And so sort of the whole full circle game, but, uh, that, uh, that tip that I pulled out of that book really, uh, changed my behavior in a big way. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I can't like handwritten notes. I'm like, I'm trying to think the last time I've handwritten a note, but that just hits different because nobody does that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. 
my, my hands sore on Fridays, but it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're keeping those muscles strong. Though. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That is, I mean, that's amazing perspective though. Cause like, you know, to think like how, you know, we go through our day and we're like, oh man, so many things to do. We're so busy. And they're like, you know, I imagine like your schedule is probably just like packed with stuff, but the fact that you've, you've intentionally thought to take out time to, yeah. to thank people, not only for, you know, the way that they've kind of like impacted you, but also to, you know, to make sure that you keep that sort of like level headed understanding of like, you know, it, mm-hmm. it can't just be about me. And you're like giving intentional time where you could, you know, put that off to an automation. And so the kind of the, the, di- the dichotomy of the, uh, delegating things and then also like taking time to do something that you could delegate yourself is just, that was kind of mind blowing. So I'm well, yeah. Th- yeah. Thank you for that. I, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think, um, uh, the, for me, the point of delegating tasks is to make sure that I can lean into tasks that add real value for myself and for others. Yeah. And that is a task that I will never let go of because I think it, uh, it, it, does more for me than it does for the people I'm writing to. And at least unless every, it's just a large number of people who really like to make me feel good about myself. And that doesn't match the world. I know yeah. uh, <laughs> then, then it does something for the, the people I'm writing to as well. And so I, yeah. uh, I love it. It's a fun habit. It's, it's a yeah. quirky habit, but I enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. I think it's awesome. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. You want to take this next one? Go ahead. You're on a roll. All right. No, I'll, right. I'll jump in I'll, when I'll necessary because I'll probably ask a question that's not <laughs> on here as we talk. So. Yeah. Um, okay. So actually, you know what? Real quick, before we do jump yeah. into like the more, I don't want to say serious questions. These are, you know, just questions related to our topic. Um, I did want to ask you on the show because we can't finish this without, you know, talking about Michigan football. So <laughs> what, what is, what's one thing that has you most excited about this upcoming season for Michigan? Um, uh, McCarthy. Uh, yeah. I think you, we gave him a taste of what, uh, what that championship could look like. Yeah. I think he's coming back hungry. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm honestly like, I'm super excited about JJ. Like that's who JJ McCarthy's uh, oh, okay. our quarterback. Michigan. And he was what? 19 this last he season. So I mean, the, yeah. Wow. The the idea that he was competing at the level he was how how old was uh was UGA's quarterback? He was like twenty five. Uh, twenty five, right? I think. Yeah. 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 So so <laughs> I, not to take anything away from UGA because they were no. dominant, but you yeah. had a twenty five year old quarterback. Yeah. He's got six years more experience than our guy had. Yeah, yeah. And the idea that uh JJ could be performing at the level he is yeah. at his age, I, the sky's the limit for it's this kid. It's yeah. amazing. I'm really excited and I feel like that just entire offensive side of the ball is going to be amazing strong and you know blake coming back and oh, Donovan. can you believe that oh, like, man. I, he'll never hear this but blake thank you like, <laughs> man you know, see, i don't know what you're thinking but i'm grateful for you yeah. <laughs> all my family in michigan listening if you see blake quorum yeah, in the streets, please just stop him uh <laughs> this, in the this random guy down know. in woodstock he's grateful to you yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All, yes. right. All right, cool. Um, got that done. Now. <laughs> um, we'll be back to it. We're yeah. not done. <laughs> it's in, it's in everything. Yes. Um, so how would you describe your company's culture and, and what makes it unique compared to other, uh, similar firms in your industry? Yeah. Uh, great question. Um, and I absolutely, I, I know everybody thinks their company culture is the best, or at least they're taught to lie about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I love talking about black airplanes specifically about the culture because I think it's so unique. Yeah. Uh, we, I would, if I had to boil it down, I would tell you it's high trust. Mm. Um, everybody, you know, we get into cliche words like family and those guys and, and especially in today's day and age, everybody, as soon as I say that into a microphone, everybody cringes who's yeah. got their earbuds in, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're one of those. But, yeah. <laughs> but like, I honestly, I think you can walk person to person through the company and talk to them. And, and so I, I like the word high trust because it's, it is an environment in which, um, <laughs> I was going to say failure is okay. Uh, and I, I mean that and don't, what I mean is yeah. not that and we're certainly not striving for it, but it's a, we're a fail fast environment and we are a, um, an environment that encourages experimentation and working and yeah. uh, breaking things yeah. and doing it together. And so there's sort of this shared 
accountability and responsibility and understanding that the person next to you is not going to be cutting you off at the Mm -hmm. knees. Yeah. Uh, And we've built that intentionally. It's a, it's a company where so many of our, so much of our senior talent came through an apprenticeship pool and really built Mm -hmm. up from scratch. And, and in doing that, they built an affinity and a love for the company and the people there. And so it's a, it's a, I guess the best way I can illustrate it. We've got an employee who was fostering kids, Mm. um, and, uh, David and I are equal owners at the company. We had nothing to do with this. Uh, one of the foster kids was having an issue yeah. and the company went around and took up an offering mm-hmm. for oh, the family. Wow. And like, I, I, I haven't asked them to share it. So I'll just say it this way. Yeah. It was way more money than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> anyone wow. would bring. And what was so fun about that is that the company and the owners had nothing to do with it. So yeah. that for me sort of exemplifies the culture of you've got 25 to 30 people in that, uh, in that company that just genuinely work to take care of each other. We've got five values like everybody, but the one that everyone can quote right off the bat is we invest in each other. Mm -hmm. And so we always like to say we invest in each other personally and professionally. I want a team of people who desperately cares that the person next to them is getting better in their trade, but also cares to know their kids' names and wants to invest in them personally. And I think we've accomplished that. And so I, uh, I love the company for that because culture is something that Culture is like a, uh, it's like a snowball you push down the top of the mountain, right? You, yeah. you don't get to pack all the snow onto it. You yeah. just kind of hope it continues it taking yeah. pace. Yeah. And man, did it take off in a way that uh, if you'd asked me five years ago, I, I yeah. would never have been able to predict that we would have hit it. Um, it we would have built a company and a culture like this. And yeah. so <laughs> it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a, a storybook fairy tale for me. I love That's it. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I, I can't tell you how many times I've come into the office and, you know, had every intention of doing a ton of work and like got a lot of stuff done, but just sat and talked with like Ben about like our kids or, you know, stuff. Well, I'm going to have to ruin the culture now. This is. <laughs> <laughs> I love that though. It's, it's exactly, it's a team of people that I really do believe care about each other. And that's, uh, that's not something that you can dictate. It's not Mm -hmm. something you can build intentionally. It's something that you hire people you believe will fit that mold and then you encourage them to take part in it. And it's been so much fun to watch the company take that off. And so, um, I, part of what I love about it is that, uh, it, it built itself, right. It's a, it's, it's not something you can build on your own. And so Mm -hmm. it's so much fun because, um, like David and I'll have people thank us for the culture of black airplane all the time. I kind of laugh it off because yeah. it's, it's not a, it's, it's one of those things that we all take part in. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know, I feel like we uh, outkicked our coverage with a players in this company <laughs> in so many ways, professionally, but certainly personally. And we've just got a great group of personalities who, yeah. who care yeah. and are invested. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Man. Um, all right. So love that answer. <laughs> what about, uh, um, so this question kind of came up from, you know, something that I, from, from the inside kind of experienced with you guys. But, um, so how do you approach communicating challenging situations within your organization? Um, and you know, to be specific, like this was surrounding kind of, you know, for, for developers or people in the kind of like technology world, you know, recent events have kind of made things a little uncomfortable mm. from the, you know, just overarching like career long-term standpoint financially. So, um, just for, for context, but, um, just from, from your point of view, like, how do you, you know, start that, uh, process? Yeah. Um, well, I guess to say for any of my employees listening, we're in a very secure position. So, yeah. <laughs> so you're in a great company in an industry in that, uh, in that standpoint. Um, I, uh, there's no clean right answer to this question. I think the cleanest and best distilled I can make it is that we try to be as, uh, as transparent, direct, and, um, human as possible. Yeah. So, uh, leading a company doesn't mean you have any of the right answers. Certainly doesn't mean you have, uh, significantly more context than other people do, especially in large scale environmental issues. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, the goal is to walk the path together. Yeah. Uh, and so David and I talk all the time about, uh, we hire adults. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so if we hire adults, let's treat them like adults. Right. Yeah. So we, we, uh, we try really hard to make sure that we are communicating early and often with the team about, whatever comes apart, comes our way. And in the last yeah. five years, we've certainly run into enough of it. Yeah. Um, the pandemic was a great example of how in the world do we handle this? What do we do? Yeah. Uh, we were one of the first, uh, companies in the area to send everybody home. Mm. Uh, and it was a really back in those days, like we were a work from office all the time kind of shop. And mm-hmm. so it was a really interesting, 
uh, shift in culture and behavior for the company. And so how do we do this in a way that doesn't impact either the outcomes for our customers and partners or yeah. the culture and feel for our employees? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we found communication was the key to that. Yeah. And I find that that's true in 90% of challenges you face, whether you're leading a business or a city or a family or mm -hmm. um, wherever you are in life, uh, the majority of challenges you come on only get harder if you're not adequately communicating with the people around you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we try really hard to make sure that uh, the people who call black airplane, their work home, don't find themselves feeling like they're in the dark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when they do, that's, uh, omission, not intention. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so we try to really make sure that, um, it's a, it's an open and transparent culture at black airplane. Yeah. I think we've accomplished that. I know there are places we can improve it. So we're constantly trying to do that. That's awesome. I love that you said that you, you communicate in a way that's human, right? Cause there's, they're sharing information and then there's just like, you know, brain dumping. Right. And, you know, just telling people way too many things that'll stress them out and make them anxious, but mm -hmm. communicating in a way that lets them know, like to give them the ability to make decisions, but not that, you know, in a way that like kind of seizes them up in their life. And the goal is to empower the team, not to dump my problems on them. Right. So, uh, the, the nature of owning a company is you take on heartache and risk and challenge that yeah. your team didn't sign up for. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the nature of owning it is that, that we've signed up for it. We volunteered to be that yeah. uh, and to carry that load. Yeah. And so you have to be intentional with your communication and make sure that you're adding value and not adding stress in it. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean that communication can't be stressful and that the problems that you face aren't stressful, mm -hmm, but it right. does mean that the way you're communicating it should be um, exactly what you said. I'm, I want to empower you to make decisions that are right for yourself and your family and this team. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to dump my problems onto you yeah. mm -hmm. so that now you get to shoulder that burden with me. So, <laughs> right. so walking that balance is always imperfect, but that's the, that's the challenge you're trying to level. And so, yeah, uh, yeah the, the word human for me strikes as a, um, uh, I need to, I need to have enough empathy to understand how they're going to perceive what I'm sharing and how I'm sharing it. And then yeah. ensure that I'm sharing it in a way that adds the most value to them, which means they have a clear understanding of what's happening yeah. and a, um, and feel a clear vision and path to resolution, yeah. mm -hmm. not ambiguity. Yeah. So dri driving that clear path, I think is always the mission in communication. Yeah. That's awesome. That's yeah. That's way above and beyond. Is, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sounds good on a podcast, put it in practice and then yeah, see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the hard part. Right? Uh -huh. It's taking that information. Yeah. It's like applying. I'll tell you, it. it's all black and white. It's all shades of gray. Everything gets mucky when you actually get yeah. into the adventure. But yeah. um, it's, uh, I don't know. I, I think intention is such an, is such an important part of communication yeah. uh, and making sure that you're communicating intention well yeah. is, uh, is the most important part. Yeah. Absolutely. You want to take one? I'm I feel like I'm, I'm like hogging all of the time. Yeah, <laughs> no, the it's, time. you're doing good. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so you mentioned, you just talked about communication and, and, and really putting the human element back into, um, just having a conversation. And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about in the beginning where, you know, you're the leader of a company and oftentimes in some companies, leadership is, um, employees don't talk to their leaders. <laughs> right. Right. And so, um, it's not like that at black airplanes. And, and you said also that that requires intentionality. You have to be super intentional about that. Um, can you share examples um, of how your company supports employee growth, learning and development, um, both professionally and like personally? Yeah. Um, so the cheesy line I use all the all the time around the office is I, I want everybody to retire at black airplane, but I recognize it's probably not realistic. Yeah. Uh, and so the, at a bare minimum, I want to make sure nobody is making a, level move out. Mm -hmm. So everybody should be leveling up if they're leaving. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and if you're not leveling up within, then something's gone wrong. So yeah. we, we are hyper focused um, both culturally and institutionally at Black Airplane on ensuring that everyone in the company has a path to growth. Mm -hmm. uh, and honestly, in our field, if you're not growing and learning, yeah. you're irrelevant extremely fast. And yeah. that goes for both the company and for the individuals that make it up. Yeah. And so it is vitally important in technology and development to ensure that we are not just getting to know our trade today, but getting to know what's coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it is, it, it has to be in our DNA. If we're right. not encouraging internal growth then we're not, we're not competing yeah. uh, today or tomorrow. Right. Yeah. So we've really tried to build the company around that. We were, um, 
We uh, are the only company I know of in Metro Atlanta or the Southeast who offers uh, an apprenticeship program where we will bring people in who are completely green, no, no code. And rather than treating it like the uh, boot camps that you see all the, all around where somebody mm-hmm. comes in and pays 30 grand to go get a certificate, yeah. uh, we pay them to come learn how to code yeah. and put oh, them wow. on a six month ramp to get to a point where they're doing real production development code. And now after five, six years, we've got some of our most senior people went through that process from start wow. to finish. And so yeah. I, uh, I, when we talk about like learning and growth and empowerment at black airplane at the start, those were really fun words. And there were things yeah. we were aspiring to. Yeah. It's really fun to look around now and realize some of the people who make the most money at black airplane yeah. didn't know how to code before they got there. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and so we've watched it, like we've watched it in action and it mm-hmm. works. And so it made, uh, it certainly made a believer out of me. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we invest really heavily as a company, both financially and just time-wise and energy-wise mm-hmm. in the growth of our people. Um, I think uh, as you talk to our team, you'll see we try to get creative with them too. And and part of that, I don't want to pretend that we're going to them with, hey, have you thought about going to this conference? But yeah. we try to be really open to anybody who comes to us with an idea on ways they could be growing. We yeah. try to make sure we're empowering that. Right. Um, a good example would be uh, Will Marple has really hit mm. the speaking circuit lately. Yeah. Uh, all around the country, he's been speaking on nationally. Will uh, is famous. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. And, uh, and, and went from six months ago, I don't know he'd ever really taken a stage before, to now mm. he's speaking on national stages and, yeah. uh, and I'm just so freaking proud of him. And it's such a great example of yeah. growth in ways that, um, six months ago, I think if you'd asked him about that, I don't know, he would have told you it was really in his path. And now it's such a core part of yeah. uh, how, who he's becoming as a professional. Yeah. Cause I love stories like that because I think black airplane, um, for both me and for the other people who call it home, mm-hmm. uh, get to see, um, growth paths that we wouldn't have been afforded anywhere else. Mm-hmm. So we, we try really hard to make sure we're providing that for the people who work with yeah. us. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. That's almost unheard of. And in, uh, in cultures feel like it's like you're on a hamster wheel, steadily trying to keep up with yeah. the clients. And so there, they, there's not enough, um, margin for people to be able to grow because mm. they're so packed with what they have to do it's, with right now. So yeah. it's, uh, it works really well. And, and I keep using the word intentional. So sorry, I'm a broken record today, but we're, we're intentional about it. But at the same yeah. time, it's, it's in our interest, right? We want yeah. to be competitive. We want to make sure we're, we're cutting edge. And so that requires that kind of learning. Mm-hmm. But yeah. in, at the same t- token, we have incredible customers and partners who also want that for our people. And, and it's in their interest too, right? Yeah. So it's this sort of yeah. beautiful, all of the incentives align and it's the right thing to do. Right. And so uh, we get to do it and it's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah. It's, Absolutely. It, Cause I feel like it's easy to be like as a development firm to just lean into like produce, 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 mm-hmm. and just look for sort of the top tier talent that can get things out most efficiently and kind of, you know, mm-hmm. constantly, you know, right. Busting down the clock. But when you, you invest in like building people that has a completely different feel. And I think mm-hmm. it, speaks well, volumes to the quality and not just the, and thank you for that. I think that's really what it comes down to too, is investing in the people. And I, I got to give David a ton of credit here is um, he is just constantly looking at the products we're building and how is the team mm-hmm. enjoying that? And mm-hmm. are, are they the kinds of things the team wants to build? And if they're not, I mean, we've abandoned entire tech stacks before that yeah. were, we were, I'll say we were ahead of our time abandoning them, <laughs> which means we left money on the table, but it was, it was intentional because the team wasn't enjoying it and it wasn't, it didn't have a long-term future. Yeah. And I think you watch a lot of firms in our space who are far more concerned with grabbing that easy dollar today, yeah. as mm-hmm. opposed to being focused on where's the industry going and what do my people want to be doing? Yeah. And so we try to be really intentional in um, both investing and building out the individual and their capabilities, as well as making sure that the kind of work that we are actively selling and chasing is the kind of work that will help feed that funnel. Yeah. So it's a, it's a comprehensive package that uh, takes a lot of work to kind of keep all the plates spinning and we're constantly breaking them, but you get them back up again and start spinning. (laughs) (laughs) Just on that uh, note about David, like he's actually, you know, taking time to just like talk to me about kind of the, direction that my career has taken. And so, you know, he's helped me a ton with like figuring that out because I'm sort of a multi-passionate ADHD a little bit. And so I can be like, Oh yeah, these, all these things look nice. And so I'm going to try to do all of them. (laughs) But he, you know, conversations that we've had have kind of helped me like focus and kind of drive towards a specific goal and whether it's learning or, Mm -hmm. you know, getting a new skill, just 
you know, he's like, Hey, you want to go this direction? Like, these are the things you need to focus on. And Mm -hmm. what I love about David Leggett is, uh, I can tell you he, in those conversations, Mm -hmm. David was hyper intentional and, and, um, I know the feeling you had because I get to have it with David where you sit and you watch him and you know, like he's locked in and he's thinking about what's best for you and he's into it. And there are a hundred people who could tell that same story. And Mm -hmm. I love David because he's just got a heart for teaching and a heart for helping people get to the next level and uh, is just amazing at it. I mean, the the guy is incredible at everything, which is (laughs) <laughs> all together frustrating, but he, uh, but he's so good at just investing in people. And I mean, you talk about a busy guy that is, mm-hmm. uh, that's a guy who is constantly yeah. overflowing with work to do and yet somehow always makes the time for people. And I just, yeah. I adore the guy. Yeah. <laughs> he always seems so calm too. He's, like, <laughs> he's, he's erupting under the surface, but he puts on a really good, <laughs> Yeah. He's, you know, that's what it's part of what I love about. He's a great, uh, if I had to pick a Sherlock in real life, that's yeah. David Leggett. Like the guy just sees the whole picture. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I love getting a partner with him, but he's uh, David and I've been friends forever. And so yeah. I just, I think the world of the guy. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yo, y'all have a, a one, two punch that is unmatched. We have so. fun, man. We make a good team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, all right. Um, keep it rolling. So how do you assess, uh, solving business slash technical problems? And is there a method or test that you use to recognize the difference? Yeah. So dig Mm. into this one further for me, because um, I'm curious how you define a technical problem versus a business problem. Right. So, um, and this is something that I've kind of like had some, some personal, uh, struggles with. So say for instance, like a, a company runs a specific part of their, um, I can't give a specific example, but Mm -hmm. say they run a part of their business in a way that um, that is going to lead to problems, whether it's done, Mm -hmm. you know, pen and paper by hand or whether you need to develop a technology that kind of wraps around it to support that process. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, so, I mean, just kind of arbitrarily say like um, payroll for a like a an entity that doesn't represent like an an employee, maybe like, Mm -hmm. maybe like, you know, referrals or something like that. But the structure of how that program is set up is like, maybe the, the structure of the program is wrong. Right. Right. That might be a business problem versus you just don't have the technology around it to make that program work in a way that's like efficient and, um, doesn't require like a ton of man hours to, to, um, to keep, uh, to keep moving. So, yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it does. Um, so I think my short answer is all problems are business problems. Okay. Uh, but, uh, my, my longer answer I think would be that, uh, it, it sort of goes back to, um, a good example would be what we were talking about earlier with, uh, when, when we cut out a, uh, product offering because Mm -hmm. the team doesn't want to work on it, but that's a moment where we're asking the question, first and foremost, is there a market for this product offering? Yes, there is. Okay. Well, do I have people who are excited about doing it? No, I don't. Well, I've got two outcomes I can go after. Mm -hmm. I can either hire in team members who do want to do that and Mm -hmm. I can fill that market segment, or I can recognize, you know, I've got a team right now that's focused on a, on a different segment that is really Mm -hmm. what we do and it's where we want to go for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And so I have to decide, do I want to execute on, do I want to continue to execute on this market segment or do I want to abandon it because I don't think there's a real future there. And so it's that recognition of, is this an execution problem or is it an underlying who are we as a business problem? Um, there's no clean way to divide that sometimes, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes and always in all things, it's a gamble. Yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, for us, we try really hard to be a process driven company. So mm-hmm. anything we're doing more than three times, we're building processes around. Yeah. Uh, we try really hard to make sure that we are meeting market segments that have both a long-term future as well as add real value for the clients. Okay. And then most importantly are things that the team that we employ and work with are going to be excited about building because in a service-based industry, mm-hmm. if my team's not excited about it. I'm not going to, add, I'm not going to yield the kind of value that somebody who has a team that's excited about it could. Yeah. Right. So it's uh, it comes down to, uh, there is no way on any of these problems to, uh, I think, build process around how you differentiate them. Mm. They're all underlying business problems at the end of mm-hmm. the day. Right. And they all have unique, weird variables that you have never, you've never come across before <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that you get to try to take on. Yeah. And so you try to put them through this sort of 
business experience filter of, okay, I've dealt with these kinds of problems that fell similar. Mm -hmm. And all the while you're recognizing I'm shoving square pegs into round holes here, (laughs) but, uh, but you make it work and you get to the end of it and hindsight tells you whether you're right or not. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. I mean, now I'm thinking about it, that that's perspective. Cause I guess from like, from a developer standpoint, I think about certain problems and I'm like, okay, this isn't, when I'm, when I'm asked to build something for it, I'm like, okay, this isn't really a, a technical problem. Like this isn't something that we should be building a tool for. This is something we should be re rethinking or retooling the, the business structure. Right. For. Yeah. Um, and so the kind of entrepreneurial side of my brain flips on and I'm like, the business process needs to change. Right. And, yeah. And yeah. sometimes you're absolutely right. Uh, and sometimes you're wrong. And so yeah. I, I, a yeah. good example of that, I guess, would be uh, handwriting notes, right? Yeah. It is mm-hmm. a terribly inefficient thing to do. Right. But I have a genuine business case for it, yes. uh, yeah. both in my personal and my professional lives. Yeah. Right. And so you've got to, sometimes it's stepping back that step further to say, okay, is there a way we could do this more efficiently? Yes. Yeah. Why are we doing it the way we're doing it? Is there is there an, a different, even ethereal value that I'm yielding in doing mm-hmm. it this way versus the other? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes the answer is no, at which point, yeah, we should be re refocusing on the business process as opposed right. to the actual technical yield. Yeah. But sometimes the answer is absolutely. We're getting something else out of this. Let's keep in. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And you just said yeah. something that, um, you said, if we do something more than three times, we're building a process around it. What yeah. made you, that identify? sounds like such a good rule that does not yeah. get practiced to the rule that I would like it yeah. to. <laughs> why, why three times? Look, because I, I told yeah. you before I'm a doer at heart. And so yeah. I, I like to think I'm a, I'm a guy who can get out and execute on a plan. And, uh, when I tell you that I have to be intentional about delegation yeah. and not just doing that, I yeah. mean it. And so yeah. I make, I have to make these rules for myself along the way. Yeah. Uh, and so that for me is a, um, if I'm doing something over and over again, odds are good, whether I'm delegating it today or eventually I will eventually have to delegate it. Yeah. Uh, if we're going to continue to scale, if we're going to grow the thing out, then eventually it's going to get to a point where I'm not doing that task anymore. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm doing it now. And the best way to be able to position it to hand it off sooner than later is to build a process around mm-hmm. it. So making yeah. sure that that's not being done differently every time, making sure that we have the process documented, um, preferably in both a video and a text format, yeah. Yeah. like having the ability uh, to hand that off. And then it also, I mean, <laughs> morbidly, it also solves the hit by a bus test, right? Yeah. Like yeah. If I get hit by a bus tomorrow, we've got 25 families that rely on black airplane. It yeah. better be yeah. a machine that can, somebody else can pick up my role and run with it. Right. If they can't, then I'm not just being selfish or I'm not just being, um, reckless for myself and my own process yeah. I'm being selfish and reckless for the team and their livelihoods as well. Yeah. So like I said, it's never as clean as it should yeah. be, but, uh, in my head, that's the rule I try to practice is yeah. those tasks that I know are repetitive that I'm doing over and over, even complex processes mm-hmm. that I'm defining them, documenting them, getting them somewhere into a repository. So that, that way down yeah. the road, I can either hand them off intentionally mm-hmm. or if I'm unintentionally handing off all of my tasks because yeah. the bus found me <laughs> that it's at yeah. least done in a clean, uh, clean and healthy way for the team. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah that is the worst, uh, re redelegation of tasks. It's like uh, getting hit by a bus. I agree. Bus yeah. yeah. It, it'll force you to delegate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have to clear his Kanban board. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Yeah. I, I, uh, um, uh, as the city, we, uh, uh, our department heads, we do, we've got a book club, just like we've got a black airplane now. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so once a month we go through a series of chapters in the book and we're going through a book called making a manager right now. Yeah. And, uh, the author, she argued that she hates the phrase hit by a bus, yeah. uh, because she talks about how morbid it is. And I, it's a phrase I've used forever and I'm sure, I mean, I recognize that's true, but yeah. she tried to say, um, consider it a, uh, instead of describing it that way, describe it as a, um, sabbatical test. Like if you were to take sabbatical and I went, it doesn't work because if I'm taking a surprise (laughs) sabbatical, (laughs) the whole point of the test is that we didn't know it was coming, right? Right. Is it sustainable if that person disappears and none of us knew not, is it sustainable if they tell me in six months they're going on sabbatical and then they disappear Mm -hmm. and I know three months later they're coming back. That's that's not the test. Yeah. Yeah, That's not the same. Also a surprise sabbatical is very irresponsible. That's exactly I'll tell you surprise sabbatical. You guys need to figure out how to get me out of the company. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody seen it? It's, I love the idea of surprise sabbatical. I want one of those. Yeah. <laughs> I want sabbatical at all, but right. surprise sabbatical sounds amazing. Yeah. It's very exciting. <laughs> Goodness. Yeah. Surprise sabbatical. Except for the people that aren't on surprise sabbatical. They're not yeah. excited. They're, they're less excited. Yeah. yeah. Unless we define the right processes. You know? That's <laughs> right. Just in case. Um, okay, cool. Um, let's see. I'm going to, 
I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I feel like some of these questions are kind of like uh, a little, they're probably going to be a little bit repetitive yeah, to great. some of the things that you've already, already said. Hmm. Um, but this, this question, uh, no, actually this is the next question. Sorry. This one? No, I was looking at the, the, oh. the one that is the next question. I'm just okay. <laughs> confusing myself. But um, so this sort of leans into a little bit of, you know, both of your roles, both at you know Black Airplane as and as a mayor, um, a public official. So, what role do you see um, sort of regulations and standards playing in guiding responsible technology usage, and how does your company stay informed? Yeah, this is such a good question, and if I had the answer to this, I'd be worth a lot more money than I am. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I honestly, I think this is going to be the ethical and moral dilemma of our time. Mm -hmm. uh, how we answer this question will be the legacy we hand to f the next five generations. Yeah. Um, we're redefining, uh, we're in a new industrial revolution right now. Yeah. Mean, we're changing the face of work uh, from everything uh, through, we watched it over the last decade through the advent of social media and how that mm -hmm. changed cultural behavior. Yeah. We're certainly about to watch it over the next five years in the uh, advent of AI and yeah. mm -hmm. um, the <laughs> The advancement that's making and the rate at which it's making it, yeah. uh, I know the Wall Street Journal had an article out yesterday where it was talking about uh, how that is expected in the next, I think it was two or three years, mm -hmm. to dramatically impact 80% of the workforce. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about sizable cultural change, yeah. sizable mm -hmm. workforce change. Uh, and there is no world in which the government is going to be able to adequately get ahead of answering those questions. No, <laughs> uh, we're bad at everything. I guess. <laughs> so I, I have no idea how we appropriately and wisely tackle these dilemmas because these are different than previous eras, technological advancements where they changed everything. But at the end of the day, if you turned out getting it wrong, mm -hmm. both the market and culture could, could correct it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is so, so much more complex. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so uh, I think a huge part of this is ensuring that the people who are um, building and creating this technology mm -hmm. are being conscientious, yeah. that they're operating in an open and transparent manner, yeah. uh, that we ideally stop this from being a Cold War style race between giant mm -hmm. technology behemoths who are trying to get to the market first and we make it a collaborative yeah. um greater humanity technology advancement. Yeah. But then the realist in me kicks in and recognizes there's no world in which that's the way this mm -mm. is going to play out. And yeah. so it requires all of us to be significantly more intentional and um, conscientious than we were in the last decade with social media. Yeah. Uh, this drives me back to a silly lesson. Uh, so growing up, my father used to make me every day, I used to have to stand in the mirror and I had to raise my right hand and I had to say, <laughs> I'm Michael Caldwell, I'm responsible for the consequences of my actions. Mm. And, uh, I did that for as early as I can remember until the day I graduated high school. Okay. And it taught and instilled in me this idea that, um, the world doesn't happen to me. I happen to the world, right? Yeah. I am responsible for the consequences of my actions and consequences can be positive or negative, but mm -hmm. I drive those. Yeah. And we have got to build that mindset in people. If we're mm. going to be able to technology in and of itself isn't and cannot be evil, yeah. but people can do really awful things with yeah. it. Yeah. And so uh, as this becomes even more ingrained in not just how we work, but who we are, yeah. uh, we watched a, decade of social media end up awful. I mean, just yeah. really yeah. bad outcomes. Yeah. Um, and, and I say that we've seen so much both economic and cultural value come out of it too. The, yeah. the, the, the world as disconnected and isolated as we all feel in so many ways is more connected than it's ever been. And so we put mm -hmm. on our, uh, whatever the opposite of rose colored glasses is. I don't really want to mm -hmm. guess that too long. Uh, is, and, and we look back on the last decade and what social media has done. And we remember with rose colored glasses, what it was like before that. But yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> We didn't feel less isolated when the only way you had to connect with anyone was the cheap uh, flip cell phone that you had mm -hmm. in your pocket. Yeah. Uh, we just felt isolated for different reasons. Yeah. Right? Now we feel isolated in a in a tunnel full of noise. Yeah. But yeah. The, the problem is we're, we're using those tools in ways that are are dangerous right. and yeah. we're raising kids in that environment now. Yeah, I <laughs> I don't think we've even scratched the surface on figuring out what this next generation of technology is going yeah. to do. Yeah. Um, there is no way and there's no 
realistic expectation that we pause as a world to go try to hype, uh, create hypothetical scenarios and mm-hmm. address them ahead of time. Yeah. We're going to have to address this in real time, which means it has to, it cannot be done at a grand scale. It has to be done at a grand scale across every individual. Yeah. Right. And so this requires us to engage in individual responsibility, to hold our own accountability, yeah. to raise our children intentionally in this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I am an optimist at heart. And so yeah. I am hopeful yeah. that we will find these are engines that will do like every other technological advancement we've seen for the last 500 years. And mm-hmm. they will dramatically advance human society. They will do like the American economic engine has done for yeah. the last quarter millennia, which is, um, which is build wealth that raises everyone. Our, our, our poor are not in the state that the poor in India are, right? right we right. we take clean water for granted in this country. Right. Uh, so my hope is, and my expectation is that this next wave of technology will continue that advancement, that that yeah. future. But it requires we're we're past the point now where we can trust that there are forces bigger than ourselves that are that are ensuring this is all being done for our good. Yeah. Right. Uh, that that's not reality, and yeah. so we have to make sure that we are taking responsibility for ourselves and our interactions with these, uh, yeah. with these advancements. And if we do that, then, um, then I think we've got a bright future ahead. Yeah. That, if we yeah. don't, then like, like, like humanity would be without any of them, we'll, we're still doomed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I absolutely, I love that answer. And I was, I was going to, um, follow up to that. Um, but I just, thinking about, but I know. talk too long. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's so many things. Like there's so much, there's so much there to unpack. But, um, the, the one thing that hit me was like, when you said your dad had you like stand in the mirror, mm-hmm. put your hand up and that, you know, for us as parents, like we mm-hmm. are big proponents of like personal responsibility yes. for, uh, for our seven year old Canon. Yeah. And, um, my eight year old Oliver does it now. Yeah. Man, it, it is a, it's a message that's like today. It doesn't feel like, it meant like it doesn't, it, it's not sinking in at all right now. Right. Um, but well, hopefully. and, and I, I mean, I hate to sound this way, but there's a huge opportunity in that for your kids and for mine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if that doesn't sink through society wide, the kids who get that mm-hmm. are going to be in a huge advantage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I, I want this instilled in my, in my children for, for that reason. I mm-hmm. also want it instilled in my children because I know that lifelong contentment and happiness comes with the feeling that you are not always out of control. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I like about it is it's a recognition, not that I control all outcomes. Things will happen to mm-hmm. me. It's that I get to control how I respond to those things. Right. Yes. Uh, and so it, that means I never, I'm never fully out of control. I'm always right. in control of my interaction with the world yeah. right. and I take responsibility for that. Right. And, and there are times I've gotten it really wrong, <laughs> but I own that, but there are times I've gotten it really right too. And I own yeah. that. And so there's a, yeah. there's a, um, there is always room for hope and optimism. If I get to play a part, yeah. mm-hmm. if I'm, if I'm along for the ride, then the best I have is crossing my fingers, but mm-hmm. both, yeah. none of us are trapped in that. Yeah. And so totally. ensuring that we're taking what we're given and we're taking, uh, taking the uneven hands that were dealt and we're playing them yeah. is, uh, is what I want to cast, uh, mm-hmm. the vision for with my kids. Yeah. That's awesome. Absolutely. I would consider that question knocked out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> we're going to make Cannon start doing that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, so, okay. I think we've, I think we've kind of touched on everything that we wanted to, uh, in terms of the questions that we had. Um, so we're going to kind of move into our, our closing segment, yeah. you know, sadly, <laughs> yeah. I feel like I could do this all day. Um, so what questions of any do you have for us? Um, yeah. Um, okay. I love, uh, I love the format of this podcast. I love what you guys are doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys are uh, intentionally and uh, effectively investing in community, mm-hmm. both as business owners and community members. What do you want to see more of in your community? Mm. That's a good question. That is a good question. I'm going to, I'm going to start. Oh, how that turns. Yeah. Titles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you want to see more of? Go ahead. Um, so I think for me, um, like my biggest thing in, in starting this in Canon studios was the ability to, to see the stories of people like, you know, like just everyone, whether it's, you know, someone who is already kind of like at like a precipice in life and like people kind of look up to them or whether it's the person that's kind of just getting started, um, mm-hmm. kind of bootstrapping and mm-hmm. figuring it out. And then kind of like 
peel back a lot of the um, inhuman or uh, not inhuman, but the, the parts of what is happening to them or around them and get to like what drives them and wakes them up every day. So yeah. mm-hmm. really like focusing in on like each individual story and like uncovering like, okay, it's like, what is it about the human experience that is specific to each person in a way that makes them say, okay, I want to wake up today and I want to do X, Y, Z versus like, I'm just going to, you know, sit around, do nothing. Um, and the reason for that is, you know, for, yeah, you know, the longest time, you know, even to this day, like I've struggled with just like depression and anxiety and like feelings of kind of like morbidity about like the future and like, you know, what it has for us. And so being able to like focus on those stories mm-hmm. has really provided this like true North guiding light that mm-hmm. there is a purpose that is beyond each individual. Like there's a, so there's like an individual story and um, kind of uh trend line that we follow and then there's like the overall like human story and that like seeing how those two things connect is really fascinating and it really like that's what motivates me that's what like gets me up in the morning and so Mm -hmm. um yeah finding those things and um being able to share them in a way that is like interesting compelling um i think they're interesting and compelling just like raw but i think you know human attention span kind of like has evolved and so being able to to format it in a way that is able to grab that attention span and get people to to notice and say like oh wow that's a, yeah that's pretty amazing i want to know more about that i love that connecting people so that's, yeah that's it for me yeah kind of kind of the same thing um when we started this and even when we talk to people now about whether it's creating content or sharing their story. Um, I think especially with, uh, social media over just over time, right. There's been like this divisiveness, but I think if we truly sit down and talk with people, we can see that we have so much more in common, um, than we do not, than we don't. And so, um, I think for us, it's really, we would just like to to talk to more people and just hear their story, yeah. whether they become a client or whatever that we may, we, you know, never have to work with them, but really just to hear their story because, um, a lot of people think their story is insignificant, mm-hmm. but it's so impactful. Right. And so no two stories are alike, but right. there are similar situations that be, that may be able to help someone that you're sitting across from. And so I think for us, that's really what it is in, in just meeting different people that, um, that are willing to, you know, share whatever. So, um, I love that. Yeah. I I love your focus on stories. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I told you earlier, I'm not a big fiction reader, but my favorite, uh, one of my favorite quotes of all time was Mark Twain. He said the Mm -hmm. difference between fiction and nonfiction is that fiction has to be believable. Mm -hmm. And it's so I, I'm not a big fiction fan, but I'm a huge story fan. Uh, I'm a believer. And so I believe the entire story of humanity is a story of redemption. And I think Mm -hmm. that, uh, learning individual stories is such a great, interesting way to, um, to learn, to see the beauty of the human story in yeah. practice, to understand how it all weaves into that fabric of the at large narrative. Yeah. Right. And, uh, so I love the focus on story. I think at the end right. of the day, everything we all do always is story. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Which, yeah. Well, speaking of story, this is another thing that I wanted to touch on, but yeah. Um, <laughs> So I know that you and I both play D and D. Yes. That's like storytelling. The, um, yeah. <laughs> and it's number hard. one. Yeah. That's I, I played twice. I love it. Yeah. She's she's joined us. I just wanted it. to this is gonna sound bad. I just wanted to like fight and kill <laughs> yep. everything. Yep. And that's how we all start. Don't I worry. was like <laughs> we all get in that way. Yeah. I was like, the I don't care about man. there's there doesn't yeah. sound bad. I'm like, I didn't care about like we had a table run for years <laughs> and I played a character named Taylor the Swift. Yes. <laughs> I did. I told you we'd come back. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Taylor the Swift. Yeah. Man, that. Yes. <laughs> years. Taylor the Swift is a, deserves a spot on the, uh, on the Pantheon. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Taylor the Swift. That's funny. Yeah. And you, you were a paladin, right? I was. Oh, man. I was paladin. Yeah. Uh, Oath of Vengeance, obviously. Oh, okay. yeah. yeah. Of course. <laughs> Um, we were in that era at the time. So all of, yeah, you know, <laughs> the breakup songs, uh-huh. and, you know, <laughs> I see reputation rolling around. That's, yeah. that's right. Take there are like, 
you might have half a Taylor Swift fan listening to this <laughs> podcast who understands these references I'm making. Everybody else is so upset. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I really hope that I got elected. <laughs> <laughs> we get the government we deserve y'all. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, that's the, you know, it's motivation or it's like, uh, um, Might be motivation to run for office for somebody in Woodstock out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 like. <laughs> but see, I feel like Taylor Swift is a really good storyteller. That's what yep. makes her an incredible Absolutely. artist. Mm-hmm. And so I think without that, anybody can sing. Well, I can't sing. Anybody can right. sing a song, right? But it, <laughs> it's that connection that Absolutely. you feel in each story. I mean, in yeah. each song that she has. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. I'm not a big Swifty. Maybe I'll I'll get into Taylor Swift. Yeah. Now we we'll all see. will be eventually. <laughs> <laughs> it's not if, but when. Yes, That's right. When. All right. Last question, Michael. This is my favorite question. Hmm. Imagine that you've just won like an Emmy or a Grammy or some sort of major <laughs> award, right? I mean, I was good at something. <laughs> unlikely, but okay. <laughs> what would you say in your thank you speech? Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> Oh, it's a podcast, so I want this to be so unique, but in reality, it wouldn't be, right? <laughs> uh, none of those features are actually unique unless they're upsetting, and I would, <laughs> I'm not looking for that. Um, I, I, look, I think uh, I God has blessed me in ways I will never be able to fathom uh, and has positioned me. He's given me a unique set of talents uh, and positioned me in places where I've gotten to have an outsized um hopefully positive role in the communities that I live, whether that's my city or my company or my family or uh, just my group of uh, friends. And I hope that that has been for good. I hope that I've added more value than I've taken, um, but I'm grateful to have had the opportunity to do it. Uh, I, uh, if I were on a stage thanking for an award, uh, I married my high school sweetheart <laughs> and I absolutely, uh, I tell Katie all the time, if you leave me, I'm going with you. Like I, <laughs> I think I absolutely hit it out of the park. I feel for her, but I hit it out of the park. Uh, and so it's been such an awesome story that I've gotten to live out. And yeah. it's been such a story of partnerships and friendships and leaning in and investing in people. And they have they have yielded that for me in ways that I could never have imagined. And so, uh, for everything that I've, I've gotten to accomplish that led me to this award today, uh, <laughs> I am, uh, I'm just beyond grateful for the people who've poured into me over my life because, uh, without them, uh, I, I was, I remain an idiot, but I would have been an idiot without any ability to add any value. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a fun story. That's awesome. man. Yeah. And we do the, uh, <gasps> <laughs> we added some hand claps. Yeah. We'll do that. We'll add those in and post. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs> Give me a pause button. Yes. Oh, Absolutely. Man. You got to thank my mom in there too, right? I think yeah. that's what everybody has to do. Yeah. Yep. Good. <laughs> we'll, go to, we'll cut that in. Perfect. Thank you. And thank my mom too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, man, we really appreciate it. We, know that you have like a super busy schedule. So the fact that you took the time out to come and sit with us and share some wisdom, we're forever grateful. Uh, I I have enjoyed it more than you guys know. I'm grateful for the opportunity and the invitation. And if I can ever help y'all or anybody listening with anything, please don't hesitate to reach out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, cool. That's where we're going to wrap it up. Um, Yeah. (laughs) Subscribe to the, to the show, follow it. um, All those words. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks guys. Thanks. (laughs)